Relativity. The very mention of the word strikes fear into the minds of those who don't understand the concept. That is, most people. However, while Einstein's ideas are profound and somewhat counterintuitive, they are actually very simple to understand, if you can follow the logic through without being misled. And this is what I shall try to do in this video, the first in a series where I'll eventually attempt to derive all of the fundamental laws of modern physics in this way. Einstein built his theory of special relativity on two postulates, fundamental assumptions that he derived everything else from. The first is Galileo's good old-fashioned principle of relativity, that laws of physics are the same in every inertial frame of reference, i.e., to the point of view of an observer moving at a constant velocity, it is impossible for them to tell that they are moving. Therefore, special relativity only applies in the special case of an inertial frame moving uniformly. Accelerating frames require general relativity, which is much, much, much more complicated. But we won't be bogged down in that, at least not for now. Let's take a closer look at different frames of reference. Imagine a tank driving along a road. From the frame of reference of the road, the tank is moving with a constant velocity. Let's call it U. However, for the tank driver, the tank is stationary and the road is moving backwards with velocity minus U. Both of these points of view are valid inertial frames. Now suppose the tank fires a shell with velocity V relative to the tank. Of course, to someone standing by the road, the shell appears to have velocity U plus V. Keep this thought in mind. Now, the second postulate is a bit more interesting. The speed of light is the same in every inertial frame. In the late 1800s, it was thought that light waves travelled through something called the luminiferous ether. Just like water waves need water to move through. In 1887, two American scientists, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley, attempted to measure the ether wind as the Earth moved through the ether. Their apparatus looked like this, with two arms, one parallel to the ether wind, and the other perpendicular to it. They expected the light sent along the parallel arm to be delayed by the ether wind, causing destructive interference between the two beams. However, the light always took the same time to travel down both arms. There was no ether wind, which led Einstein to introduce his radical second postulate, which has some interesting consequences. Our tank's gun has now been upgraded to a big scary laser. Again, when the laser fires, the light travels at velocity c, the speed of light, relative to the tank. However, from our observer on the ground, the speed observed is not u plus c, it is still just c. Think about that for a few seconds. Now, it's time to talk about, well, time. In Einstein's thought experiments, time is measured with a light clock, which ticks when a particle of light bounces off one of these mirrors. We'll suppose that the speed of light is very slow, and therefore the clock ticks every second. Let's set one of these clocks in motion. Inside its own frame of reference, the clock still ticks every second. However, from outside, the light has to take a longer diagonal path. Since the light must still travel this increased distance at the same speed, it must take more time. Therefore, time on a moving object appears to slow down, an effect known as time dilation. Simultaneous events can even be separated by time dilation. Here, a pulse of light is sent to sensors on both ends of a moving train. From inside the train, light takes the same time to reach both sensors, so they activate simultaneously. But from outside, light gets to the back sensor long before it can catch up to the front sensor. The person on board our tank has a slower clock, but he still has to measure the speed of light to be the same, otherwise he could tell that he was moving. Since speed equals distance divided by time, a longer time taken must also mean a shorter distance for the light to travel to measure the same speed. So objects also become shorter as they approach light speed. This is called length contraction. 
The consequences of special relativity are very strange, but they have been tested by experiment. GPS satellites need to correct for time dilation to allow their measurements to be accurate. Also, remember the principle of relativity. Not only does our tank appear to get shorter and has slower time from the outside, an external observer also becomes thinner and has slower time, seen from inside the tank. There is one final consequence of special relativity. E equals mc squared is possibly the most well-known equation in the world. Most people know that it means that mass and energy are equivalent, by a very large factor. If all of the 4 kilogram mass in a baby was converted into energy by annihilating it with a 4 kilogram anti-baby, it would release 719 petajoules, about 11,400 Hiroshima bombs worth of energy. The speed of light squared is a very large number, but why is E equal to mc squared, and how does this fit in with the rest of special relativity? One of the assumptions we need to derive Einstein's equation is that of relativistic mass, the mass of an object increases as it approaches the speed of light. This is itself derived from the law of time dilation, so if you haven't watched part 1, go and see it now. Now, imagine another train travelling at near the speed of light through a station. Remember that the train gets shorter in the direction that it's moving and has slower time. A person on the platform throws out a red ball at velocity v towards the train, and someone on the train throws a blue ball in the opposite direction. The two balls collide perfectly elastically in midair meaning that the red ball bounces back towards the platform with velocity minus v. However, the time for the blue ball is slowed down as it is moving so quickly along the track, and there is negligible length contraction perpendicular to the direction of motion, so its speed in this direction must be less than v as seen from the platform. Let's just say it's three quarters as much. In the collision, momentum, which is equal to mass times velocity, must be conserved. And the only way this can happen is if the mass of the blue ball is greater than the mass of the red ball. If I display the masses of the balls, you'll see the blue ball weighs four thirds as much as the red one, in this case. Looking at this from the frame of reference of the train, the same happens, except the mass of the red ball is now larger. This is where the bane of sci-fi accuracy comes from. As you approach the speed of light, your mass increases and so the force required to accelerate you also increases. At C, your relativistic mass is now infinite, and so you cannot be accelerated further. Faster than light travel is therefore impossible, unless you use certain tricks, for example the Alcubierre warp drive, wormholes, or quantum teleportation, all of which may be the subject for a future application video, once I get the fundamentals down. However, all we need to know for this derivation is that nothing's velocity can be greater than c. Now, we can see how energy can be converted into mass. Imagine a spaceship travelling infinitely close to the speed of light. For one second, a force is applied to the spaceship. Thanks to Newton's second law, a force applied for a certain time produces a change in momentum. Since the ship cannot go any faster, that change in momentum must be due to an increase in relativistic mass, rather than velocity, which stays at c. Let's say the ship's mass increases by amount m. The change in momentum is therefore mc, which is produced by a force of magnitude mc, acting for one second. The distance travelled in this time equals speed times time, so it travels c meters when the force is acting on it. The energy gained by something is defined as the force applied multiplied by the distance travelled, therefore the energy, E, equals force, mc, times distance, c, which gives us E equals mc squared. Now, this derivation only applies in this specific case, and it requires very complicated mathematics to prove this to be true for all situations and for all types of energy, but it can be done. Einstein showed that energy and mass were facets of the same thing, mass energy, which is always conserved in any interaction. His formulas had many applications, for example nuclear power, which is so efficient because some of the mass of the nuclei has turned into large amounts of energy. Einstein's theory of general relativity 
is one of the fundamental pillars of modern physics. Its elegant accuracy means that it's still the best theory cosmologists have to understand the force of gravity. But how and why are its predictions true? For general relativity, we must first expand on the first postulate of special relativity, to enable it to include accelerating frames. Einstein did this with something called the equivalence principle. Imagine men in two lifts, one in a tall lift shaft on Earth, and one in a spaceship floating weightlessly in deep space. The cable of the first lift breaks, putting it into freefall and accelerating towards the ground. Now, both men are floating freely inside the lifts in the same way. Therefore, Einstein assumed that gravitational freefall and true weightlessness were equivalent. Since you cannot feel its effect accelerating you, he wondered whether gravity was even a force at all. Now the first lift hits the ground, and at the same time, the spaceship turns on its engines and accelerates upwards. Now both men fall to the floor of their lifts, and once again the lifts cannot be distinguished. This shows that the effects of acceleration can also be produced by gravity, and vice versa. These two thought experiments led Einstein to classify gravity as a so-called fictitious force, along with the inertial force that pushes you back in an accelerating car, or the centrifugal force that throws you towards the outside of a roller coaster loop. Fictitious forces are not caused by two objects interacting, but are rather a consequence of being accelerated. Let's go back to our free-falling lift, accelerating under the Earth's gravity. It passes two clocks on the side of the lift shaft, since our observer is in an inertial frame moving relative to the clocks, the effect of time dilation applies, so the first clock ticks slower than it would do at rest. By the time it falls past the second clock, it is accelerated to a higher speed, so there is more time dilation, and the second clock ticks even slower than the first. We can use the equivalence principle to show that this means that time will run slower lower down in the gravitational field. This is gravitational time dilation, an effect demonstrated when atomic clocks transported to the top of mountains were found to run faster than those kept at sea level. Einstein now had to work out how the mass of objects could produce acceleration. The effect of gravitational time dilation means that large masses, capable of producing a gravitational field around them, distort the space and time inside their gravitational field just like a heavy ball placed on a sheet of rubber stretches it out around the ball. However, note that it is not as simple as this. There can be no gravity pulling the objects towards the lowest point on the sheet. This is in fact what we're trying to create. So, how does warped space actually produce the effect of gravity? The best way to think about this is with a distance time graph. This particular graph is that of a stationary object in non-distorted space it traces out a horizontal line. As time passes, its position remains unchanged. Let's say it stays 6 metres away from some arbitrary point. Now we'll bring in a planet with a mass large enough to cause distortions. With its space-time axes warped, our graph now looks something like this. As before, the object follows the same straight line, but if we read off the displacement values, they are changing. The object is now moving, not just with a constant velocity, but it's accelerating towards the planet. This acceleration is what we call gravity. Notice that there is nothing actually pulling on the object. It's still following a straight path through spacetime, according to Newton's first law. The object just appears to accelerate because spacetime is not flat. Describing curvature of a 4D entity is difficult, but a useful analogy is the geometry of curved 2D surfaces. We are most familiar with flat plane, or Euclidean geometry, where angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees, and so on. However, this is not the only type of geometry. We can curve our flat surface into a sphere, and now we can construct a triangle with two or even three right angles. Or we can curve it the other way to form a hyperbolic plane, a strange land where triangles can have three 30 degree angles. Bernhard Riemann used some rather tricky maths to generalise this to any number of dimensions, but the basic idea is the same. On a sphere, a straight line, the shortest distance between two points, is a section of a great circle which is actually curved. Similarly, 
The curved orbits followed by objects in gravitational fields are equivalent to straight lines in the curved geometry of spacetime. Remember the straight line on the graph still produced acceleration. Einstein used Riemann's theory to develop an equation to show how gravity formed. Here it is. g mu nu equals 8 pi g over c to the power of 4 times t mu nu. The g mu nu represents the curvature of spacetime and the t mu nu represents the distribution of matter in the universe. The bit in the middle is constant, so we can take it out and we are left with this beautiful relationship. Curvature is proportional to matter distribution. The equation, and general relativity as a whole, was summarised in this way by physicist John Wheeler. Spacetime tells matter how to move, matter tells spacetime how to curve. Einstein's equation represents half of modern physics, and thus is where we shall leave relativity for now. Next stop, the weird world of quantum mechanics. See you there! We hope you have enjoyed this video and for more videos go to freakphysics.com.